and welcome to another Songs and Sounds concert from Song in the City. Our theme today is mental health. As I'm sure you're aware, the last year has been like no other, and we have all faced a wave of varying challenges. Over time, challenges can take their toll as they begin to nibble away at your perceptions, your thoughts and your emotions. Song and poetry have often been useful avenues for people to express their thoughts and, and feelings. When it comes to explicitly tackling mental health, there are most often songs in the classical repertoire that depict madness, from lengthy, elaborate and often rather beautiful uh, operatic arias, to songs like, or song cycles, like Strauss's Ophelia Lieder. <laughs> to more contemporary depictions. <laughs> While they cover aspects of the fragility of the human mind, does modern music dig that little bit deeper? Is it more subtle in its depictions or does it lay our vulnerabilities bare? In 2014, Song in the City ran a project in collaboration with the Guildhall School of Music and Drama and Maudsley Charity, where mental health service users and student composers came together to create new music. Today, we will be featuring two songs by composer Vahan Solorian that came from that project one of which has poetry written by mental health campaigner Johnny Benjamin MBE. You'll hear an interview with Johnny himself about his work and his involvement in the project. We also have music by and interviews with three other wonderful composers, Rose Miranda Hall with poet David Gilbert, Jeff Hammond and Laurie Leitman. Today we are raising money for the charity Beyond, it's a charity founded by Johnny Benjamin to work with young people to challenge and change the mental health status quo. If you'd like to contribute, then 50% of all proceeds will go towards Beyond, while the rest will go towards uh, Song in the City and our next concerts. Gavin and I have loved preparing our concerts and we have done so voluntarily. A donation, however small, would mean that not only will money go towards a vital charity, but it means that we can continue making these concerts and have the opportunity to invite other artists, improve the quality of the videos, uh, and also even comp uh, pay composers to, to make music about themes that are important to you. All right, that's the sales pitch done. Now time for the music. Um, thank you so much for your support, and we hope you enjoy. Thanks.
Hi, my name is Lori Leitman, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about my song, Kindness, which is from my song cycle entitled The Blood Jet. This song cycle was commissioned by Dr. Adelaide Whitaker, whom I have known for over two decades. She has not only been a champion of my music, but has become a close personal friend. She has a particular interest in having me set the poetry of female poets, and she specifically asked me to set the poetry of Sylvia Plath. It took me about two years to secure the proper permission before I could even start writing this song cycle. And um, I wrote the cycle between February and December of 2006, but the work did not premiere until May of 2010, when I accompanied the wonderful soprano Shari Gruber in a recital of my music at the Cosmos Club in Washington, D.C. The use of pentatonic melodies is a nod to the mention of Japanese silks, which I take to be a design on her bathrobe or pajamas. The song builds to a climax as Plath reveals her driving force. The blood jet is poetry, is repeated for emphasis. A short coda follows, and the return of the piano's opening sparse figuration reminds us that her depression will trump all not even the love of her two beautiful children could save her from her eventual suicide. Plath was brutally honest about life and her exceptional use of language was always organic. Like all great art, one can always discover something new about the poem with each new reading. I find the construction of her poetry to be multi-layered and akin to the way I compose songs because her words and ideas connect and build through each poem, just as my notes, phrases, and ideas build to create a multi-layered miniature sound universe. I have witnessed the crushing debilitation that accompanies depression in several close relatives. I understand the hopelessness that occurs as one falls into this deep black hole. This firsthand experience gave me some insight into Plath's thinking and allowed me to think of an appropriate musical setting for kindness. I have also seen that if one is lucky, has the right resources, and is willing to get help, that it is possible to recover. I chose four poems for the cycle because I felt they would allow me to construct a compelling dramatic arc. 
the outer two poems focus on Platt's role and happiness as a mother, while the interior poems reveal her troubled marital relationship and the extent of her depression. The opening accompaniment of kindness is purposely very sparse. Each hand only plays one note at a time in a very predictable and rhythmic pattern, thus portraying the flattened emotional aspect of someone who is depressed. To mirror the more complicated situation when the poet speaks about reality and her doubts about kindness being a solution to depression, the rhythms in the music become syncopated. This texture builds to its fullest to emphasize the words, oh kindness, kindness. I came to the project through um, the recommendation of my psychiatrist that I was seeing at the time. I've been a service user of SLAM for 40 years next year. I heard about the project through uh, uh, being treated at Speedwell CMHT. As it was introduced to me, it was an opportunity for service users like me to put our words to music with aspiring composers. There's been a series of workshops that's run over the past few months where we met the poets. We got given their kind of anthology books of all the poems that they've written. And then from there, we picked basically which ones we thought kind of leapt out at us that we thought we'd be able to set really well. The composer that chose my poem was David Bentley. And um, we spoke about the poem and what I was kind of trying to express. I understand you try to say. I haven't suffered from mental illness myself. So trying to sing as a character uh, who has suffered with mental illness as well, I mean, actually meeting people who have suffered and discovering, you know, that they are just people who have had an illness happen to them. Um, and then, you know, the consequences of that uh, and the suffering can be enormous. I think people were very open about their experiences. People didn't hold back about what, um, what they'd been through. In my experience, uh, severe depression was like you were dead already. And that was what my poem was about as well. It was about losing all those wonderful senses and colours and feelings. I think it really did inspire me to write some poetry. I think also to to write about my experiences and sometimes it could be quite cathartic. It was a really uh, lovely experience to go through. I felt that, that we did bond in a way, not just the writers together or people who had had those experiences, but I felt there was a, a general bond between us all. So I'm really delighted to be joined by Johnny Benjamin, MBE, who is an award-winning mental health campaigner, film producer, uh, public speaker, writer and vlogger. And uh, welcome, Johnny. And I just wondered if you just start by just telling us a little bit about your the amazing journey you've had uh, as a campaigner these last few years. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much for, for talking to me. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's been a, it's been an interesting uh, few years. I, I uh, well, it's actually been about ten years now. Um, I started making films on my experience of, of having mental health issues. Um, I was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder when I was twenty, and I was really unwell, and I was in hospital. Um, people might know me maybe from. I did a documentary um, on Channel 4 about basically finding the stranger who taught me off of uh, a bridge when I wasn't well. When I was, uh, yeah, in a really, really, uh, really awful place. Um, and yeah, I found the stranger and we were reunited and we started to work together. And it's been a really incredible few years, to be honest. Um, yeah, been 
traveling around uh, the, the UK and actually parts of the world doing mental health work, uh, giving, giving talks, doing workshops on, on mental health. And um, while, while also, to be honest, while also, you know, still battling my own mental health issues, and had a few relapses, um, you know, it's quite, it can be challenging, it can be really challenging particularly through, through the pa pandemic, which, you know, I know everyone, well, not everyone, but most people have really struggled through, through, the, through the pandemic. And I had a relapse. I was in hospital um, a few months ago, which was really tough because of all the restrictions because of COVID. But yeah, anyway, it's been, um, yeah, it's definitely been a, an interesting few years where I've seen things shift in terms of mental health. Um, I, I have a youth mental health charity called Beyond and we do a lot of work with young people and I definitely feel like the next generation, things are changing, they're so much more open, I'm generalising, but they're so much more open and uh, willing to talk about it, willing to get help. Uh, when I was at school, no one ever talked about it. Um, so I feel like things are moving in the, in the right direction. It's your charity, Beyond, you've just done a festival, haven't you, this, in February? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did a we did a the first ever festival for schools and colleges uh, mental health festival in in Children's Mental Health Week, and that was amazing. We had over twelve hundred schools and colleges um, take part around the UK and actually around the world. Um, get involved with all sorts of different things during the day. I mean, we had everything from from mindfulness to to music workshops actually. Um, looking at positive psychology, stress management, all sorts of different things we had. Um, and now what we're doing is we are, well, at the moment we're fundraising, we want to be able to give grants to, um, to uh, schools that can't afford any mental health support. You know, there's a number of schools that just, they're desperate for support for their students, for their staff. And, you know, we, there's long waiting lists, as we all know, for, for mental health support. So we're trying to put things in place so that they can get help and support. Great, really wonderful work. It's fantastic. You've come such a long way. Uh, I first came across you as a, a poet um, on your YouTube channel. And I know that you've, of course, continued to write and you've got a book coming out soon, haven't you? Which I have on order, by the way. It's... Oh, <laughs> um, which is the Book of Hope, isn't it? The Book of Hope, Let's yeah. Tell a bit about that. Mm. So the Book of Hope is, um, is essentially, it's, a, it's a, a kind of I've collated over the past few years um, 101 different contributions from people from again all over the world people different walks of life um, people you know well-known people like um, Joe Wicks the body coach and uh, Rylan and you know Frank Turner musician um, basically all, all having you know shared how they have found hope in difficult times how they've overcome challenges and I just think yeah we need it more than ever you know people need to find some hope and some inspiration you know I know I certainly have during particularly, particularly during the last this this last lockdown in winter has been really tough for well not just for me but for so many people I know so I really hope this book will yeah give people some some sort of light and some inspiration because I think it's really needed absolutely we'll buy the book of hope we'll make sure we put a link Oh, okay. uh, in the chat underneath this uh, concept. <laughs> um, yeah, as I said, the, the, um, I remember sort of seeing you, you must be back in, uh, you know, six, seven years ago on your YouTube channels. Um, in fact, the first poem I ever saw, I think was your poem called The Womb. Mm -hmm. And um, and of course, we, we in the Creative Madness in Song project we did at Song in the City set your... Uh, Vahan Salorian set your poem Melancholy um, and yeah what roles poetry you know played for you in your in your life yeah I mean poetry and also some songwriting actually it's played a huge huge role in my journey I, I started songwriting actually when I was about 16 16 17 when I was starting to really struggle with my mental health um and then I turned to poetry when I was 20, when I was in hospital for the first time. I don't know, I just, I was given this notebook in hospital and um, I, I couldn't really vocalise what was going on. 
so I would write and it turned into poetry and um, very dark, very dark poetry. Um, but that's that's what was going through my head at the time. So, you know, um, it was it was really helpful. It was really helpful for me. Um, and yeah, I've used poetry and songwriting throughout my whole I always seem to write when there's something that's gone wrong, to be honest, uh, which, you know, I know I'm not, I'm not the only one, I guess, but you know, when there's been like a, yeah, when something bad's happened, like, I don't know, a breakup or something like that, I turn to writing songs or poetry. Um, I'd like to write poetry and songs when I'm in a better place, but I never seem to. Well, there's something about also sharing it with other people that obviously it's enormous help to them as well hope so yeah i hope so i really hope so um yeah yeah i i just yeah um i just know that you know other people can relate and i i get a lot from reading other people's poetry or listening to their music again particularly when it's you know when it when it's very frank and honest and you know um you know, there's a lot of music that I listen to, which is, uh, or poetry that I read, which is kind of upbeat and joyful, but I really relate to the poetry and the songs that are, uh, talk about mental health, you know, mm. talk about mental health very, in a very honest and frank way. Mm. I know on the, on the first time we did the, the project with Song in the City, there was uh, one writer who had written all her life, but she'd never ever she'd always destroyed everything mm. um so there was something there's a positive thing that comes out of sometimes publishing or like putting out there those yeah. feelings and you know certainly sharing it with other people is, you know can be incredibly liberating and yeah. reducing stigmas as well around it yeah. absolutely absolutely so um i don't know if you can think back to um <laughs> Mm -hmm. We set some of your poems to music. Um, we're going to be performing again uh, Vahan's uh, setting mm -hmm. of Melancholy. I don't know, can you remember what it was like to hear somebody else take your words and sing them and set them to music? Mm. It was... Uh, it was... Um, it was... Uh, I, I just, it was a bit painful, if I'm honest. It was quite painful um hearing <laughs> basically you know for me if i've if i'm if i'm in a good place and then i i'm hearing someone sing those those words for when i was in a really dark place i'm like oh my gosh i wrote, I wrote that like it's quite um jarring and yeah it can be a bit, can be quite painful um but at the same time also like really i'm just like wow like it's just amazing how you know someone else could interpret those words and, and, and make them into something. Um, but I just, yeah, I, it, it feels quite surreal, I think. Cause you know, I, like Melancholy, I wrote in a really, really, really bad place. Um, and so then, yeah, to, to hear someone then singing those words and, and putting that poetry to, to music. Um, yeah, it's quite, it's quite surreal. Uh, it's quite surreal. Um, and it takes me back when, to when I like wrote the poem and a lot, lot of emotions come up, I think, a lot of emotions. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting experience. Well, thank you very much for letting us <laughs> uh, use your words like that. No, cause really. I think for us as performers as well, it's, it's, it's great to you know, get to know you and then have that responsibility to someone's text and you know there's a there is a kind of relationship going on there and also as a pianist I was I'm always interested in you know as soon as the piano starts playing in that song it's playing this repeated kind of note mm -hmm. you know kind of empty in fact I think he writes on the music emotionless and mm -hmm. amazing I always think what music does to sort of create an atmosphere just around the words even just by the, the sounds yeah. there's definitely an atmosphere in that in that song um <laughs> Yeah, almost almost without the words, even I think you know, you get a sense of melancholy yeah. and, and pain, <laughs> um, and then obviously you know the words come in and, and that voice and um, 
yeah it really well for me i don't know what it does to other people it really gets me i guess well i think even if it wasn't my own words it would still really get me um it's just so emotive you know it's so emotive um both the the tune and the words and you know and the way it's sung it's really yeah really emotive So the two songs that are going to be in the concert are two so uh, kind of adaptions of two songs that I wrote for the Creative Madness project, which um, was run by Song in the City many years ago when I was just a young lad. <laughs> um, but it's been actually quite fun to go back to them. Um, I'd say there's definitely my writing style has changed, but I'm still I'm still happy with them, and I think. For the nature of the project and what it was aiming to do, I, I'm quite happy with the kind of simplicity of them and the brevity as well. Uh, and yeah, so the project was writing um, songs working alongside um, NHS mental health service users. Um, and I did three songs and two, these two, um, the first one is called Melancholy and it's by Johnny Benjamin. And then the second one, the last time I saw you, is by Emma Maddox. Um, and we got a choice of we got a choice of poems to select from, and these two could, like leapt out straight away, especially in sort of the time period that we were working on this project. I was at the beginning of what were quite a, a number of turbulent, messy, not very nice years for myself as well, and. Um, Certainly with Melancholy, as soon as I read it, because I was experiencing quite similar things at the time, musically it kind of le leapt out and I could hear exactly what I thought it should sound like, which is just this kind of empty drone that just continues through your, through your life and your existence when you're, when you're having those feelings of depression. Um, and Emma's poem is kind of the exact opposite of that. It's this nostalgic, really, beautiful lovely um poem about kind of a love lost um and i know with the project that that had there'd been efforts to set that already and what i i really enjoyed about Emma was even just from an email i could tell that she was a real like eccentric um talented person who knew what she wanted and um i hadn't really written for voice until i did this project which is weird because now um, I'd say almost all the music that I'm writing is, is opera and song and like musical theatre as well this year, which has been a really nice little bit of a change for me, but I love, I love musical theatre. 
<clears throat> and so yeah, I like um, I kind of liked this classical song form, which maybe I hadn't, as an instrumentalist, I hadn't really been exposed to very much, or I hadn't actually listened to it myself. Uh, and yeah, this idea of like just these nice little bite-sized musical morsels of of a story, and then it's just over. And this short form thing really, really appealed to me. Um, and yeah, I really enjoyed the, the challenge with Emma of hearing what she wanted and what this poem was about to her and then making my music fit that. And I think I think it was quite successful in the end. She seemed to be really happy with it, which is kind of the biggest compliment um, that you could get really working with these people. wrote The Last of the Lighthouse Keepers um, through a project with David Gilbert um, and librettist, soprano, dramaturg, superstar, Lila Palmer, um, after I met David at a arts and mental health conference, I think it was 2016, um, all, all that time back, um, and then about a year later we um, decided to collaborate together on what turned out to be a participatory song cycle, poetry cycle, mini opera, um, written for and alongside mental health uh, service users. Um, and so the whole concept was around uh, David's piece of prose um, and parable, the, um, the Jewel Merchants. We invited mental health service users um, and on this, the, the first experience of it was at the Bethlehem Art Gallery next to the Bethlehem Hospital. Um, to come to a creative writing workshop uh, led by David, uh, where it was in response to his poetry, the parable of the jewel merchants, and also a really beautiful um, art exhibition on the theme of resilience. Mm -hmm. So um, all these people, um, ourselves included, went off into this art gallery and wrote our responses to these three things. And then during the piece of the jewel merchants, um, there's a moment where people are invited to come and share their own experiences, um, their jewels, that this piece was broken down into the, it was a skeleton of the Jewel Merchant's parable interspersed with these pieces of poetry, which were partly sung, partly spoken by David um, and underscored by cello, um, by a wonderful cellist called James Whittle. He's fantastic. So it was a parable of not only recovery, but trying to reclaim not the positive, but the assets of living through terrible difficulties, the, the resilience, the wisdom, the wisdom and insight that comes from the caves of suffering. So this parable is actually a preface to a, a professional 
piece of writing, which was a book called The Patient Revolution, and it turned into a preface for that book. And I think the other thing to, to note is that I'm writer in residence at Bethlehem Gallery, which is a super special place yeah. and a super special space where artists work and their artists first and mental health service users second, well, human second and mental health service users third. So the, it's a really empowering space where inpatients and outpatients come and do workshops, paint, draw, write. And the exhibitions are always led by people who've had their own problems. Where this song comes in the song cycle, it comes after two very personal poems. Um, one was The Jab and the other was Ward Nine. And at this point, um, you're, you're that little bit more removed watching this lighthouse keeper descend the steps, mm -hmm. moving away, and all the calamitous stuff that happens after. Mm -hmm. My own experience was looking after and being there for my mum mm. when she went through her own depressive phases and traumas and being that person in the boat mm. and trying to steer a ship. Um, that anxiety is very much in there and I start the piece off with what looks like I think quite a calm sea and it's quite low and dark and originally for cello rescored here for piano and eventually it becomes more and more tumultuous as as this storm storm comes about um when I was writing this piece I was a year out from having lost my mum to cancer so a lot of anger mm. is in this piece and sort of my own my own dealings with that loss and what what could have been and that kind of thing so five years on mm -hmm. um from from this piece um I, I would love to go back into it and look at it again from an angle of, of someone who who is healing rather than in that peak despair moment of, mm -hmm. it was pretty much a year on anniversary when we were premiering it it was a bit of a yeah. tough but beautifully serendipitous time i'm quite interested in reframing people's narratives and, and how poetry can allow that. Um, that the, the, the quote that often comes, I think it's an Emily Dickinson quote, isn't it? Sort of tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Mm -hmm. um, truth in circuit lies. And there's another Wordsworth quote, which is um, poetry is the overflow of spontaneous emotions mm -hmm. recollected in tranquility. Mm. There's something, as, as I was listening to Rose describing The Last of the Lighthouse Keepers, I, I'm, I'm struck at how clear the psychological metaphor is that I wasn't aware of at the time. You know, that the, the lighthouse keeper, the one who keeps you safe, that, that strong voice in your head, it's gone. Mm. I'm not a writer, I'm not a wordsmith. <laughs> but through, through that process I definitely discovered things within myself and my own journey um, and my relationship with my mum that I didn't have until I started really trying to like finite write these things down on paper and make them into these lines and it was quite an obsessive little I think we only had 30 minutes but it was just like this and that honing in on something very specific I thought was um, it was a very healing moment for me actually no, definitely in all my music there is an element of of me and either my joy my grief my journey mm -hmm. is always in there and that laying it out in front of an audience or to a performer being like here take this piece of me I, I originally tried to train to be a singer and the stage fright was too bad <laughs> so I now try <laughs> and write things that I think I would have loved to have sung Mm. Um, and things that I, I enjoy and what I think other people are going to enjoy singing.
So I'm very pleased to introduce composer Jeff Hannon. Um, I'm going to be performing two of his songs, um, Why Do You Think People Believe in God? and Go to Hell World. So it'd be great to learn a little bit more about both of those songs. So welcome, Jeff, and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so first of all, can you tell us a little bit about when and how these songs came to be written? Um, the the songs were written in 2004 and uh so it's quite a long time ago now <laughs> um and when i was writing them um i had in the back of my mind uh peter maxwell davis's eight songs from mad king the reason i had that in the back of my mind was i felt that the that that particular piece uh sends up the subject matter somewhat mm -hmm. and i didn't want to go down the same route mm -hmm. i felt it i couldn't um so dare i say it the the songs are a little bit of a corrective to that i know that sounds a bit pompous but th that's kind of how i felt um so the the pieces border i think maybe on reportage because um i was looking for something kind of raw and kind of authentic without too much mediation on my part mm -hmm. in other words I didn't want to self-consciously inject too much of my own aesthetic onto it. Mm. Um, it was just a simple heartfelt response to the words. Mm -hmm. The two songs are, are a pair. I often write songs in pairs. And in both cases, they, the, um, the text is from a book called Bad Madness Explained by Richard Bentle. Um, and the first song is a setting of, a, of an answer to a question, why do you think people believe in God? Mm -hmm. And the answer is what psychiatrists call jumbled word salad. Um, and I'm assuming that this is on the, at the pre-medication point. Mm -hmm. So whoever it is speaking uh, is in a completely florid, uh, what you might call delusional state. The second song is the setting of a diary entry by somebody um, post medication. And you get a sense of, well, I get a sense of kind of apathy and uh, bluntness of affect, what psychiatrists call affect, which is kind of emotional demonstrativeness. Mm. Um, and to be, I actually don't know who these people are mm. uh, because as far as I recall, they're not um, credited, mm -hmm. but I felt their words were very strong um and indeed the first song particularly is very poetic because the met there's a metaphor in there of god as a hot air balloon um which i found very striking and i you know I, when i saw them i knew instantly that i 
that I had to set them. Mm, they're, so, they're very, very interesting texts. And um, so the book itself, I actually ordered myself a copy and had a little, um, a very quick skim through just to see kind of where the text sort of sat within his writing. Um, but the book itself, it's, it's full of psychological detail and terminology. And I studied psychology at, um, at university, but it's very dense uh, with, with this terminology. Um, is, was that a, an interest of yours at the time? How did you come to, to read that, that book, for instance? Um, I wanted to understand more of what was going on um, inside myself because um, um, I had also suffered a psychosis in 2002. Right. Um, so um, me being me, I wanted to find out, well, I wanted it explained. Yeah. And in the end, I'm not sure whether the book really explained it because um, my experience, my ph phenomenological experience didn't tally with the statistical. It does pose some very interesting questions, that's for sure, about the, um, about the terminology that we use and also the, the kind of boxes that it's very easy to put mental health um, uh, issues into when actually the, the lines are much more blurred than that, I think. Um, and quickly, just about the, the second piece as well. So I think it was, um, it, um, it came from, as you say, a diary entry of a, but it was a 32 year old man. I was just wondering about this because um, why did the female voice in your songs feel right for you rather than using a, a male voice, you know, setting it for a male voice? In the score, um, I actually write female vocalists. I don't write soprano or mezzo soprano. Yeah. Mm. So I left it deliberately vague and, and open as to who could sing these songs. I mean, mm. I wonder whether Tom Waits could sing these songs, for example. I was going to say, with regards to the openness of the score as well, um, with regards to detail, it's it's quite simple. Um, there aren't any dynamic markings for for either the voice or or the no. pianist. Was that a was that a conscious choice at the time? No. Dynamics, I think, especially with, when you've got two musicians involved, they can they can do that. <laughs> yeah. um, I, don't, I don't want to be too prescriptive about what I've written. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, going back to. So um, can you tell us more about how the two songs work together as a pair? Well, with the case of these schizophrenia songs, mm -hmm. uh, I found uh, with performances of them, that unwitting audiences tend to laugh during the first song, um, probably because of the jumbled word salad and because of the, the metaphor of the hot air balloon that I was talking about. Um, what happens is that the second song contextualizes the first. And that means that the audience is forced to reevaluate what they've heard. Mm. So even while they're experiencing the second song, they're re-experiencing the first they're doing a double take in their mind. Um, so it, the expressive effect of them both as a whole is stronger than the expressive effect of one alone. Mm. So I think that's the reason why um, the songs work as a pair. And that's maybe the reason why I write songs in pairs in general. There's also a logical progression, I suppose, from the kind of unmedicated floridness of the first one to the slightly frozen mm. uh, aspect of the second. And that to me is, um, the experience, I think, of many in the in the psychiatric system. So that I, I wanted to get that kind of resonance across as well. So, yes, I mean, I wasn't very well when I wrote the pieces. Um, they're the first pieces I wrote during my convalescence. Um, I don't know whether that kind of comes across, but whether, whether it does or it doesn't, the pieces are not really about me. Um, the pieces are, the, the songs are more universal than that, I hope. I designed them to raise awareness about certain things, um, to encourage a certain empathy towards people who are stricken in this way. Mm. Um, and that's it. it. In their simplicity, it does feel like a, a door is opened into, you know, as you say, in a lot of these kind of mad settings, especially in, in opera particularly as well, it's always very florid, it's always very dramatic, um, whereas uh, these are so simple that every, everything is stripped back and you actually get to the pure essence of of these people um, and how they're how they're struggling. Well, I'm glad you say that because, yeah, that's what I was hoping for. Oh! <laughs> 
Thank you.